In this video, I'm going to show you how to write your very first smart contract in Rust. I'm going to deploy a Hello World contract so you can write your name on the blockchain. I'm then going to go into talking a little bit about what smart contracts are good for, what they're not so good for, and where this technology is going and why it's disruptive to the foundations of the web. We're then going to look at a slightly more useful example where we're going to do some testing and integrate a smart contract into a web-based front end. And then finally, I'm going to finish with free tips for new smart contract developers. So if we go to soropg.com, we have this online IDE here, which is designed for building and deploying Soroban-based Rust smart contracts. So we'll have this example contract here. I'm going to delete the unit test for now. We're going to come back to these. And then I'm going to change this. I'm importing the Soroban SDK on the second line. And we'll add in a string variable. A string is like a piece of text. So it means that we can return hello world or our name, whatever we want to return from a contract function. We then have this example contract, which has a single function, which in this case is an addition function. But I want to change this to hello. And I want to get rid of these numbers, these integers. And I don't want, to I don't want any input variables, but I want to return a string. And then in this section, I'm going to delete this A plus B. I'm just going to put string from string. I'm going to pass through the environmental variable, which contains like the blockchain state and all that stuff. And I'm going to put James as the string we're going to return. So let's go through and we haven't got any unit tests, but we can still compile that and make sure it's all compiling. If we get any errors, we'll get them here, which we do have. So I've got the underscore here. I just need to delete that because we're actually using this end variable. Let's run that again. And there's no test, but it's all compiling fine. Now we can build that to a WebAssembly file. So before we deploy it to a remote network, we need to compile this Rust-based contract into WebAssembly. Let's go ahead and do that. And you see that's downloaded that to the file system, my local file system. So we've got a .wasm file basically called example contract. Now I'm going to generate a new wallet. This is our public key here. And this is just a testnet wallet. But what it's also going to do when you click that generate button is it's going to load it with testnet XLM. Whenever you interact with a remote blockchain network, you have to pay a transaction fee to kind of store the contract on the network. And we have some testnet XLM delivered free to our account. Let's go ahead and deploy that WebAssembly file. Put this example contract. And it's submitting a transaction, transaction one of two, transaction two of two. We're waiting for confirmation. Here we go, we've got a block explorer link here, which we can go and have a look on a third party block explorer. If we go to the interface, we see we've got this hello function, which returns a string. And if we go back to the editor, we can go to load contract, which will load the contract interface into this workspace. And if we click hello here, we get the variable returned as James. Now this should seem pretty basic and simple, but what's important is what's going on in the background. We're not storing this data in a database or on a local host. It's being stored on a remote peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network. That's very powerful, but also somewhat restricting. Blockchains are really designed for small data sets. You can think of them in their current form as like shared spreadsheets or Google Doc or whatnot. A token contract, for example, might contain a ledger of addresses and then the balance is next to them. When you're dealing with important data, such as financial transactions, where the order of the data, the chronological order of the information is important, and also the integrity of that data is critical, then they're very valuable for that kind of thing. What they're not good at is storing large amounts of data, large files, for example. If you look at NFT contracts, where there might be an image or a video linked to a token contract, the actual image will be stored elsewhere on like IPFS or a local server, and then the contract will just point to that image. Well, every year it's become possible to store more and more data on chain. It's not ideally suited for that because of the way that decentralized computing works and every node on that network has to store a copy of the data. The next thing that blockchains are really good at is open, transparent kind of transactions and data sets. They're not particularly suited for private data at the moment. You want to store username and passwords, for example, on a blockchain. What work is being done to kind of look at privacy transactions and things like that. At the moment, the kind of blockchains are open, transparent, and we should embrace that about them. 
every transaction goes to every node and every node updates its kind of data set to replicate every other node. So any data stored on chain is really available to every node on the network and it's available via the block explorer. So whenever you do something on chain, everyone can see it. The real value proposition, in my opinion, for smart contracts, however, is the ability to create permissionless immutable code. What this means is that when you deploy a contract to a decentralized network, that contract doesn't necessarily have to have an owner. So just because I've deployed it doesn't mean I should have any special privileges within that contract, that kind of code logic. The contract itself can kind of be a container and it can store funds and it can have logic within it so that it treats every participant fairly. No one's given any special privileges. This is different to like a database where there's always kind of an administrative user who has access and special permissions for that centralized device. The code can also be immutable, which means that when you upload a contract, you can have upgradable contracts, but for the most part, you want to make sure that your code, especially if it's permissionless code, is immutable and it can't be changed. This allows us to kind of upload these contracts, which anyone can use, and the code is law. Any user can go on chain, and if a contract's been verified, they can go into a block explorer and get the source code. They can have a look at that source code, they can pump it into ChatGPT if they're not technical and find out what it does. What it means is that they've got this code on chain, which is shared around a decentralized network, which no one owns. No one has permission to update that code or kind of change the logic within it. And no one has special permissions or administrative rights to do anything that any other user can't do. This creates this very fair system of decentralized computing, which is very powerful and disruptive. Okay, let's dive back into the Sorobound playground and create a more useful contract. I want to create a contract which counts the number of hits a websites have. So before Google Analytics came along, we used to have PHP files that would count the number of like interactions a web page would have, and it would store them either in a database or actually on a file on the local file system. So we have got our contract. Let's reset the editor first. And in this one, I want to import two more libraries or submodules. I want to import symbol, which is kind of like a short string and symbol short. I don't want to add a key for our data storage, so I'm going to use this as just hits. I'm going to create a short symbol called hits. This is quite a convenient way to store short strings within a smart contract environment. In our example contract, I don't want to change this to hit, and I don't want to pass anything in here. I don't want to return anything. I just want this to count the number of hits to a website. So. The first thing I want to do is get the number of hits. So I'm going to go into persistent storage and get that key. So I'm creating a key value pair here. And that's going to pass back a result and I'm going to unwrap that or return zero. And then I want to update that persistent storage to the value of hits plus one. So we're setting the key as hits plus one. We need to add a second function here. I'm going to do pub fn display. I'm going to pass in environmental variables, which is the blockchain environment, and I'm going to return an I32. This is going to display how many hits our website has had. And all I'm going to do for this is copy this and return that without the semicolon in the end because I'm returning the value. I'm going to update my unit test. So I'm going to have, call this test hits. And our contract ID is the same, everything's the same. Any difference is I'm going to call client.hit a few times. Let's do that three times. And then the result I want to do i32, and I want to call display. And that should return our value, and it should return three. Let's save this and try running our unit tests. Been caught out by that underscore once more. Let's run that again. And we've got one unit test passed. So this is working as we'd expect. Once you start to level up as a blockchain developer, you'll find you spend a lot of time doing unit tests. You spend more time kind of testing code than you do actually writing creative code. In a larger, more complex smart contract, like a DeFi protocol or something, you might have multiple different Rust files doing different kind of things within the contract, and you have multiple different unit tests as well. You'd be using the Stellar client on a command line interface to run your unit tests and deploy code from there. But for this simple example, we can deploy this to the local testnet again. Let's compile this to WebAssembly. We'll get a download. 
And then let's go and deploy our contract. Let's load that contract. Call hit a couple of times and click display. You can see every time we call a hit, it's increasing this variable here, which is increasing our hit counter. Let's look at how we'd kind of integrate this onto a web page and make it actually useful. So to create a front end, I've cheated a little bit and use ChatGPT to come up with this nice little website. We'll go through this here. So it's basic index.html file and we're importing the Stellar SDK. If we go down to the JavaScript, which is the most interesting bit, we've got a contract ID. This is taken from the Soroban example here. And we're also hard coding our secret key. Now, this isn't something you want to do in production. You wouldn't normally hard code a secret key instead of the front end because that's viewable by everyone. And if there are any funds on that, any real funds, they could be taken. But in this example, just keep it simple. We are getting that key from the Stellar Labs. We're funding it with FrameBot and we're putting it in here. Generally, you'd have a contract kind of live on a decentralized network and other users would come onto the front end, connect their digital wallets to that front end and interact with it that way. We're setting up an RPC URL. The RPC node is kind of our entry point to the network. It's a computer or a device that lives on the network and it communicates with all the other nodes in the network. And it also acts as kind of our interface with the network. So we can send it transactions and it will disperse that across all the different nodes. We've then got two functions here to send a hit and fetch hits. And these are executing slightly differently. If we look at fetch hits first, we're actually simulating the transaction. So we're calling display here, which correlates with our smart contract function to kind of display that logic. And then we're going to simulate that transaction. And what this means is that we're not actually going to kind of send the transaction, which causes a transaction fee. We're just going to query our individual RPC node to check its kind of copy of the blockchain or the data store and return the value that's stored in that, within that data. We're updating this hit counter div with the amount of hits. The send hit is actually a signed transaction. Because we're modifying data, we actually have to pay a transaction fee to do this. Uh, this comes from the wallet that we've hard coded in here. And we have call in hit, which corresponds to this function here. We prepare the transaction and sign it with a key pair. We kind of sign it to give authorization for it to call that transaction. And then we send that transaction to the RPZ node to distribute it around the network. And then we console log the result. What that will do, if we open up the console here of Control Shift J, if we refresh this page, we should get a hash here. We can copy this. If we go to Stellar Experts, change it to Testnet, pop, pop in that transaction, and we'll get the transaction ID here. And you can see what it, you can see what the transaction is doing. It's invoking hits with a value of 13. So if we refresh the page, you can see the hit counter is updating every time. The beauty of this simplified demonstration is that you're not storing data within a local database. You're not storing data on your local server device. You're actually storing that on a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. And while this example is simple, it opens up a lot of opportunities for decentralized computing. All the code that you've seen here today is open source on GitHub, and I'll put a link in the description. Now I want to go through three tips for new smart contract developers. The first is to keep your contract as simple as possible. Working in a kind of decentralized computing environment is restrictive in the amount of data you can store and the amount of logic you can process. There's the kind of limits on the transactions that you can put through. What this means is there's a benefit to having your contract as a kind of fundamental layer which just has the core business logic and the real essential things that are critical to your application within there. Everything else can either go in the front end or some of a back end service, which doesn't need the security guarantees that blockchain technology provides. The second tip is to focus excessively on security, especially when you're handling user financial transactions. As a developer, you don't want to be responsible for your users losing digital assets. So it's important to do everything you can to reduce the possibility of a smart contract vulnerability. This could be things like looking at capture the flag type competitions and security research online. There's third party audits. So once your code is kind of written and complete, you can pass that off to a third party to kind of look at it just solely from a kind of security perspective. And that's extremely valuable and it can find a lot of the bugs. It's also things like Hacker One and ImmuneFi, which are kind of competitions for white hat hackers to try and look at your code and find the security responses in there, and they're rewarded financially for that. If you don't have the financial resources available to set up a bounty program or to hire a 
third party auditor, then maybe try and find someone in the community that can just kind of run their eyes over a smart contract to kind of check that it's not, there's nothing obvious in there. It's useful just to have a second pair of eyes on that contract and to look at it from a fresh perspective. The third and final tip is to use open source code. There's lots of resources online. There's a great kind of community effort to always be transparent with the source code for smart contracts within the web free community. And there's things like Open Zeppelin's contracts, which are built for Stellar. So you can go and look at how they're doing things within a Rust environment, then copy that into your own code or use the libraries directly, import them into your code, and you can set up things like token contracts very simply. And that code is all pre-audited as well. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to learn more about smart contract development, then there's some links and resources in the description. Hit the like button for YouTube algorithm, and thank you for watching.